over the years we've seen some incredible mountain bike tech developments, some really crazy stuff. Some of it good, some of it bad, and some of it downright ugly. Now today we're going to be checking out some of the most interesting mountain bike tech of all time. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to look at today is yeah, the Shimano dual control shifter and brake lever combination. So in 2003, Shimano launched these wild conceptual brake and gear levers uh, in one. They came in at the XTR level, as they always do on their product launches. Now they're basically taking inspiration from the road world, where you've got your brake levers and you've got your gear shifters in one. Now on a road bike, it makes perfect sense, because if at A, it makes things super neat and tidy, you don't have the down tube shifters to take your hand off the bars and shift them back. We didn't have that problem on mountain bikes. And of course, it's just very intuitive because the, hand, the position your hands are in when you're on the hoods, your fingers are actually drop down. So changing gear like this is just, it's a brilliant thing to do. So you can see the logic behind making a set of brake levers that you can change gear with and use your brakes. Yeah, it's a brilliant concept. And they executed it really well. It's an incredible piece of engineering. So these ones are much later. These are DRLX. They've got the hydraulic brake lever. And of course, you've got the cable actuated gears. Late, later on down the line, they did release ones with uh, cable both. So you can run them on more budget offerings. But I actually went for the launch for these in 2003, which is at Caprun in Austria. And we had to ride the World Cup cross country course, amongst other things. Now, all of the journalists were basically frothing at their mouth because they just made your handlebars look so clean and tidy. So you imagine a cross-country lightweight bike with the XTR level ones of these, which were far more compact, but really good. And we were desperate to go and ride them. But this is when we discovered a few of the issues with them. So the first one was the fact that they did rapid rise shifting at the time. So if you can imagine, if you don't remember this, um, opposite way shifting in the back. They did this for spring tension reasons and it's a different conversation to have. But essentially imagine going to change gear, uh, thinking you're going into a lower gear, you'd be going into a higher gear and vice versa. So straight away, that was confusing. Then adding to the fact that your familiarity and your muscle memory of whatever brand shifter you're using, using your thumbs, that's gone because you're using your, your fingers to change gear. So that one is gone and it's a brand new thing to do. And then on the prototypes that we were testing on this product launch, you couldn't change the hoses. So myself and the other British journalist that was there, Guy Kesteven, our brakes were the wrong way around. So adding these three things together, just made for the most comical ride. So we headed out riding some fire trail. Um, we were pretty bored of it basically by the time we got to the top and some of the journalists continued on the fire trail and we were like, nah, let's go find some single track. Yeah, and this is where it all came unstuck. So you imagine going into a tight uphill switchback turn, you change gear the wrong way accidentally into a hard gear, you forget the brakes are the wrong way around, you nearly go over the handlebars. It was just a comedy show the whole time. And then things got worse when we started descending. I don't know about you lot, but um, myself and Guy and many people I know cover your brakes when you're riding. And not only are you just covering your brakes, but you actually end up using your brake levers for some dynamic movement on the bike, like you apply pressure for your brake lever itself. When you do that with these, you change gear, yeah? And your brake lever position ends up changing as well. So the entire time you feel like everything's moving around on the bars, which A, is terrifying, B, is just unpredictable, and it just just doesn't really suit the application of mountain biking. Now, I'm sorry Shimano, but these are a bit of a flop. But I do know that they are incredibly well engineered and they do have a bit of a cult following. I do know many people that swear blind these are the best things ever. They, they absolutely love them. I mean, I think the complete opposite and I can only think the good use for them now might be on flat bar gravel bikes. It's a good suggestion, I think, but um, these ones I would say, um, yeah, not too good but kind of a great concept. Take yourselves back to the early 90s, or imagine being me in the early 90s as a young aspiring mountain biker, and the new suspension forks hit the market. So that's the RockShox RS1 and the Manitou 1. Now when they came out, they cost an awful lot of money, they really did. Um, and they didn't really play very well with all bikes out there because the fact they changed the geometry quite significantly from the sorts of forks that we were used to. We we're used to having just a regular rigid fork. Bumping them up two inches in height would change the geometry quite significantly. Now, frame manufacturers did get clued up to this and start 
tweaking the geometry, but for anyone looking for aftermarket products, they weren't always the best option, not to mention the cost. So imagine how I felt when a company called Gervin released a product called the Flexstem. It was suspension for your handlebars. It gave you an inch of travel, and it didn't change the geometry of your bike, and it cost a fraction of the price of buying a set of RockShox forks. Amazing, yeah? Great idea. So I snapped one of these up straight away. Now the story behind these is they come from a company called Offroad that made the Proflex bikes. Now they, the designer of their suspension, his name is Bob Gervin, and they actually released these as a separate product away from off-road bikes, so anyone else would be more interested in this as a separate product. Uh, often about an inch of travel, it did, did vary depending on the length of the actual part of the stem. Of course, the longer the stem was, the more travel you'd effectively have because uh, of the leverage there. And then you change the elastomer rubber bumper in here uh, for harder ones or softer ones, depending on your body weight. Now, the cool thing about these is that, again, they didn't affect your geometry when you're riding a bike. They were immensely comfortable for vibration. If you were riding a rigid, well, you were riding a rigid bike back then, they totally removed the vibration you'd get on towpaths and sort of chattery terrain. Better, much better, in fact, than early suspension forks. But they did come unstuck on the bigger stuff, and the fact it just felt weird with your bars almost rotating away from you, especially with stem lengths like this or longer. Very bizarre feeling. Uh, they also bent as well. These plates here, if you treated them to some jumps and some misbehavior like that, they would actually bow out to the side and bent. I actually bent an early one. This is one I got much later on that stayed in one piece, surprisingly actually. Kind of cool bit of kit, but laughed at by a lot of people because uh, suspension handlebars, yeah, it's a bit crazy. Well, at the time, also also thought it was a good idea, so I had a parallelogram version. There should be a couple floating up on screen. And then over the years, they kind of just got forgotten about. And you, you might have seen the odd one on commuter bikes and things like that, until Specialized recently released one for their road and gravel bikes. Uh, this is it on screen. A great concept. And although I did laugh at it thinking, gosh, it's just a polished flex stem, which it kind of is, but actually give it merit. It's got a great concept there. You don't need a suspension fork on a bike like that. It gives you an element of comfort and control that you can't quite get. And it can remove vibration and hand pain, sorts of niggling things that you get with that sort of riding. So actually I credit that with the old good old fashioned flex them. And I think it's kind of quite cool. Now there's also two other options if you're interested for suspension at your handlebar area without having to do anything to your frame or fork. There's the rev grips. Do, do I tell you about those? So a couple of years ago at Sea Otter, I checked these out. The locking collars on them have a degree of float, which you can tune with little rubber bumpers on the inside. And now I'm just to move very slightly. Sounds a bit crazy, but they are insanely comfortable and they're said to dramatically reduce arm pump. So if that's something you suffer with, definitely have a look at them. It's a cool idea. And the other option, although a bit more extreme here, is the Fast Company suspension handlebar. Yeah, suspension handlebar, this is it on screen. Look at this wild thing. So it kind of reminds me of the Flex Stem. It's got pivots on it and it's got elastomer bumpers for the bar to actually flex. Now it's not a new concept, it's actually used and it comes across from motocross. But the same concept applies. It remo removes basically all the vibration and the buzz that you get. So if you've got problems with your ulnar nerve uh, in your hand or if you suffer from arm pump, they could be good for you. The problem is they cost a small fortune. In the UK, they're about 450 quid. Yeah, that's for a handlebar. Insanely expensive. Hey, however, I do know a few people that have ridden them and they swear by them. So there is definitely something in there. But it's cool because you're not just pigeonholed basically to pick a suspension fork if you wanted to try something different there are some good options out there today and it all stems back bad pun to the Gervin flex stem okay next thing to talk about is another product from Shimano and this is the airlines system so think of this as uh, pneumatic gears so they developed this specifically for downhill racing and the idea was it removed all fatigue from the riders and it gave a like a lightning fast gear change thanks to the air pressurized lines so you'd have a canister on your bike similar size to a water bottle which you'd pre-charge giving up to i think it was about 400 uh, depending on the size of the canister about 400 shifts so plenty for a few races sort of thing but you'd have to constantly charge them up and of course you'd have to find somewhere on your bike for them. If you had a bottle cage area, that would be fine, but many riders like Dave Cullinan on his Schwinn would actually mount them under the down tube, which I always found a bit crazy with rocks and stuff flying up. But they were said to have the most incredible action because let's not forget cable routing, especially on old downhill bikes, was awful. You'd often get ghost shifting when the, the cable housing would sort of crimp and stuff and your gears would change. It was really, really quite bad in those days. So Shimano developing this got around all of that, lightning fast shifting with the tiniest of tap of the bars. 
I mean, it's an almost useless bit of technology by today's standards, but I think the Airlines is one of the coolest things ever, ever designed. Now I've got to say a huge thanks to uh, Disraeli Gears. This is an amazing resource website. You must check it out. There's gonna be a link directly to what I've been looking at here, uh, which you've just seen on screen in the comments section directly underneath this video. Please check them out. If you want to learn anything about derailers, there's loads of obscure stuff and some really interesting readings, some great journalistic stuff on here. Uh, I've, I've only got access to some really old airlines catalog stuff. The stuff I've got is not the best quality, so I'm really pleased to have seen this stuff on Disraeli Gears. Uh, super, super cool. Now, if anyone actually has an airline set, please get in touch. Tell us what it's like. I've never used them. I've only ever seen them once in passing. Didn't get close enough to even get a good enough look at them. I'd absolutely love to get a set just to, just to have a look at and try if possible to see how they work. I know there's some out there because I've seen this set on a German website. It might have, might have gone by now, but they were going for 4,200 euros. <whistles> I guess completely impractical, but aren't some of the most impractical things the coolest things? I guess they used some of the tech development behind that on electronic stuff. And then of course, Rotor did the hydraulic stuff. So I guess it is cool to see people thinking a little bit differently about the traditional shifting method using cables. Shimano Airlines, one of the coolest bits of mountain bike tech ever. Okay, so now skip to the year 2000 and the release of the Cannondale Lefty Fork. Yeah, the single leg suspension fork that still kind of defies physics really just looking at the thing. Uh, not literally, but you look at it and it just messes your head up, doesn't it? Half a fork after all. Um, so how did it start exactly? So Cannondale were trying to make an inverted, well technically in a motorcycle world it's the correct way, but an inverted suspension fork. So you've got the stanchion at the bottom instead of the top like you see on a regular fork. And the idea is your seals and everything's better lubricated. You're not relying just on the capillary action of the lube staying in place between the bushings and the uppers to do the work. It's held there by the action of the fork, held there by gravity. So. On motorbikes, you always see forks this way, but it's hard to make them stiff enough and light enough on a mountain bike. So Cannondale basically made their fork with a four-sided stanchion tube, and instead of having regular bushings around it, it had needle bearings to slide up and down. Four rows on each leg, so that's 88 needle bearings on each leg. So it had zero stiction. It felt like nothing else at the time, an incredible fork. And it was so stiff, in fact, that some race mechanics were rumored to have joked saying, oh, this thing's stiff enough, stiff enough, it could probably run on a single leg. And they basically botched one in the car park and were shocked at the fact that they were right. It did work on a single leg. So then Canada were like, hold on a second, there's something in this. And then the marketing, te marketing team would have been like, oh my God, this is gold. You've got to make this fork. So they released the lefty, basically. And you think what a technical marvel this was in 2000 when it came out. A single leg fork, you have your, your hub, basically the bolts onto a stub axle there. You've got everything in that fork. You've got your air or your coil springs, depending on what fork you had, and you have your damper in there, all in a single leg. Absolutely amazing. And yes, people loved them and people loathed them. But that is basically as a marketing dream because whatever's happening, people's talking about it. See that guy on the lefty? Oh, Brian Lopes won the dual race. He was using a lefty. He had half a fork on it and he smoked everyone. Yeah, it was amazing. The stuff of legend really is. Now, the forks were, were quite big. They used a twin upper crown to help with both stiffness and also to make sure they could house everything they needed to. So imagine my surprise when much later down the line, they released this, the Lefty Otto, which is a single crown version of the, of the Lefty Fork. Now they've slimmed this down as well. So it's lighter and it's somehow stiffer and it's better. They've just achieved the seemingly unachievable. Now if I just show you the inside of the fork here, it's actually got a three-sided leg, still using a delta cage needle bearings on there, same format, but it's triangular in format basically instead of square. So they're just saving weight by using less material on the inside there. You can see how it works if I slide it up and down and there's gonna be some details just flying past on screen so you can actually see it when it's taken apart. Just some shots we've got here. It's just an absolute marvel of engineering. It really is. And I absolutely love what this is all about. Now, if it wasn't cool enough already, being a single leg suspension faultless ultralight, it also has a couple of very cool things going on. So firstly, if you are an XC racer or any sort of racer, you could arguably see the benefit of the fact that you could change your front tire or fix the puncture without having to remove the wheel. Now that is just 
gold. So helpful. Of course, it is only on the front end, but every second counts in a race situation. Now, also, there's a big stiffness advantage with these. Now, this probably won't affect people who've got a bigger fork, like a Fox 36 or something. But if you have a Fox 32 or a RockShox Sid, perhaps, there's a phenomenon known as binding. And this can happen when you're under compression and you're braking at the same time on a super lightweight fork, especially if you're a heavy rider. The forks can twist very slightly. We're talking like a minute amount, but it could be enough that the bushes can bind slightly. And what happens is your fork effectively hardens up because it struggles to get through the travel when you need it. So this is something that you do not get with a lefty. So because of the needle bearings supported by the, the, the flat faces on each side, so three in this case or four in the old ones, there is no movement, There's zero movement, zero binding and zero stiction. These things are insane. The way that they go up and down with just no sort of, there's just nothing to hamper them. Now, if you try one of these on a suspension bike, like a cross country bike, you'll notice this straight away because it feels like the fork's almost too active. It feels like it's a bit soft, but no, that's how it's supposed to feel. An incredible piece of kit. And the final thing that's super cool about these is when they were developing the Lefty Osho single crown, they wanted to be secret about this because obviously everyone knows a Lefty, but nothing really had happened other than some minor revisions to the fork for years. So they actually had the team racers using these in broad daylight by having a 3D printed fake upper crown on, uh, check these shots on screen. So they were just using them at races, uh, winning races, doing what they do, and in plain sight. And then one day, off it came, and everyone's like, oh my God, you've got a single leg, like a single crown version. Insane, amazing piece of tech. Absolutely love the Lefty. In the mid 90s, it was all about downhill. It was the thing that was really moving on mountain bike tech. And as a result, there were some very cool products that came out. Now, one of them, the Marzocchi Bomber Z1, was a four inch travel coil operated uh, and open oil bath damper fork. There's still some of these forks flowing around now that have never been maintained that still work because of the open oil bath in them. Now, these forks were phenomenal. And they also had two sets of disc brake tabs on the lowers. Now this was something we'd not seen really on other suspension forks. And a lot of people scratch their head at this. Why on earth would you have two sets of disc brake mounts on there? Well, a British company called Cullymore Engineering uh, showed everyone by producing a double front disc brake. Yeah, this is it, check this out. So it uses a single lever and has a splitter that's mounted essentially on the fork brace, as you could see here, and you've got a double disc brake set up down at the front. Now this thing is absolutely incredible. They were immensely powerful and I love their marketing spiel. I say, for tickling off a little speed or for really slamming on the anchors. Yeah, they were, they were insanely good brakes. But you did have, from, from memory, you had to bleed them quite heavily. Quite a lot of the time, you used to get air in them quite a lot. And let's face it, you didn't really need that much power um, on a bike in those days. However, they were an amazing piece of kit. I think in their advert, they had a, an adapter and they had them on a set of RockShox DHOs, or they might have been Judy DH, I kind of forget. But the ones that were really cool were the ones you when you saw on a set of bombers, just like these ones on screen. Now, of course, one advantage of having this design in the 90s was forks were a bit more flexible. They were typically quick release. You saw less forks with a bolt through on them. So by spreading out the force of braking on two legs, arguably you got much better handling and the fork didn't suffer from binding, uh, the thing we referred to with the Cannondale lefty fork. So a very cool concept, but you just don't need that these days. We've got more powerful brakes by far. There's more mechanical advantage in brake levers. Calipers have four pistons and there's even six piston designs out there that really do apply so much pressure to the rotor and there's much bigger disc rotors as well. Combine that with forks that are stiff enough now, you don't have those binding problems that we did. However, Cullymore Engineering made this amazing dual disc brake and I think that is one of the coolest pieces of mountain bike tech, even if it's completely useless by today's standards. Well, as you can see, there is loads of crazy mountain bike tech, some of it modern and some of it from, well, from a few years back. And you know, I'm not quite finished, but we've run out of time for this show. And I'm going to carry on digging because I've got loads more where this stuff came from. And we're going to pick it up in a part two. So don't forget to let us know what you thought in the comments underneath. Tell us what you think about the crazy tech, the good, the bad, the ugly, the old, the new. And what, what do you reckon might I be putting on a show next week? Hmm. Well, uh, tune in to find out. See you later.